Hello, everybody, and welcome again to what's becoming a very regular happening, another Kubernetes update on the OpenShift Commons briefings. This time, we're going to be talking about the Kubernetes 1.8 release, um, which should be out sometime later today. Um, but I've got today both Derek Carr and Clayton Coleman with me from Red Hat to walk us through everything that's in Kubernetes 1.8, and there's a lot. So I'm going to let um, Clayton kick us off and just get started right away. So thanks, Clayton and Derek, for joining us. Thank you, Diane. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Clayton Coleman, architect for OpenShift and Kubernetes at Red Hat. Um, with me, I have Derek Carr, who's the lead engineer uh, on Kubernetes at Red Hat. And this talk is focused on giving a little glimpse of what's coming in Kubernetes 1.8 and which will eventually make it into OpenShift um, 3.8. The features here um, are a sampling because there's far too much going on in the Kubernetes project for us to ever cover in a mere hour. But we will try to do our best to give you an idea of the, the things we think are important, things that you should pay attention to, and uh, the things that uh, you may want to learn more about. Uh, we'll leave some time at the end for questions and um, we will get started now. So what's new? This release, um, Kubernetes 1.8, um, was the biggest release ever, as is no surprise for a growing project. We had over 2,000 pull requests and 2,500 commits merged um, between uh, June 30th, which was the Kubernetes uh, 1.7 uh, release date and the Kubernetes 1.8 um, release date, which is hopefully today, although um, may change uh, as circumstances demand. Uh, we had over 380 committers. Um, there were 39 features added to Kubernetes, which is actually a fairly low number if you compare it to the total number of pull requests. So don't don't underestimate the um, the amount of changes in Kubernetes. Um, there was 29 SIGs and five working groups. Um, a SIG in Kubernetes is the organizational unit of um, a, either a functional area or a user focused area. And working groups are a new concept or a fairly new concept that try to bring together people with um, disparate instances across many different parts of the Kubernetes code base to affect real change and to, to drive important initiatives. Um, in this release, we put four features to stable, and um, this is a little bit of a term I can expand on. Stable in Kubernetes usually means that we consider this a ready for general use, that we have strong API guarantees around, we won't break the APIs going forward, and also that it's general for ready uh, regular use uh, features we moved 16 features to beta, and there was a, a large number of new alpha features um, in the various areas, which I'll go into in a little bit. Um, the I think the important takeaway is Kubernetes um, is growing uh, very rapidly. And as a part of that growth, um, this release has also seen a lot of um, focus inside the Kubernetes community on stabilizing not just the things we deliver, the code, and the documentation and the examples and the tutorials and the, what it enables for Kubernetes users. But we're also focusing on the, the meta of making sure that Kubernetes is a successful community, that it is efficient, that people um, can orient themselves and work within the community. Uh, if you followed along with uh, the Kubernetes um, release, uh, or if you followed along the Kubernetes uh, mailing list, you may have seen that the steering committee elections are happening. And the steering committee is a body that will help um, uh, legislate at the highest levels um, disagreements between various parts of the project, um, as well as helping us set in place a formal structure that is community owned and community driven that ensures that everybody is able to um, participate in the ecosystem, that there's clear um, ownership between areas, and that when um, different SIGs and different working groups have uh, different directions that those can be unified and that we can we can help people make progress um, to deliverable features and to uh, ensure that Kubernetes is a stable place for people to run their software. There was a new SIG um, added in the 1.8 um, timeframe and that's SIG architecture and this is this is the SIG that tries to mediate between the different uh, Kubernetes SIGs and help uh, organize the direction of the project to take some of the philosophies and principles um, that exist from the technical what is Kubernetes to um, API conventions and general patterns that we try to uh, instill across the platform and to help ensure that everybody um, in all the different SIGs has a place to go to get 
uh, when coordination between SIGs um, is not as efficient as it could be, or when something impacts multiple SIGs, SIG architecture was the place to um, to bring issues and to get answers, as well as to help identify when um, others need to be brought in to help move the process along. Um, part of part of SIG architecture's responsibility is going to help be to formalize the proposal process, which is how um, large changes to Kubernetes are proposed, discussed, designed, uh, and iterated on. That proposal process um, just got a new name in the last couple of days called the Kubernetes Enhancement Proposal, uh, although that itself is, um, since it's a process, may subject to change over time. And we've doubled down um, across the project in the investment on things like testing, contributor experience, documentation, um, ensuring that the the business of kubernetes is flowing so uh, flowing smoothly and as always you know our goal with kubernetes is to build uh, an inclusive ecosystem that is able to uh, serve as a as a valid or as a powerful core for distributed applications for microservices for legacy apps moving into the cloud um, anything containerized should be able to run on kubernetes and a part of that is making sure that not just the core of kubernetes works well but that others are able to, to orient themselves to what Kubernetes is doing and to fit within the ecosystem well. So that, that goal, um, you know, across the entire 1.8 release, um, we really did try to focus on what was really important in Kubernetes. And as Kubernetes has evolved, as we've, um, as we've built out new features and new areas, things that Kubernetes helps users accomplish. Uh, kind of across the board in the community, we felt that it was a good idea to begin focusing a little bit more strongly across the board on stability, as well as taking features that uh, we had added in previous releases and putting a little bit of extra effort on moving those uh, into a stable state. And uh, on the Red Hat side, uh, Red Hat's uh, focus in Kubernetes has always been on making Kubernetes boring on ensuring that uh, it is a stable place for people to run applications and that uh, Red Hat can deliver that um, through the OpenShift origin project and through um, OpenShift Online and OpenShift Dedicated, deliver that to people in a stable and predictable way. And so with this release, um, the overarching theme was stability and graduating features from alpha to beta or beta to stable, um, but also some very specific things um, that we've done uh, in the in the 1.8 timeframe to make uh, Kubernetes uh, better at scale. So the first one of these um, is just straight across the board bug fixing. Uh, I talked about maturing features. There was a lot more emphasis put on taking existing features and closing out the loose ends that gets them to the next step versus adding new features. And making production work well, uh, taking feedback from regular Kubernetes users from the various um, deployments of Kubernetes, both in the cloud and on-premise, trying to synthesize those down into a couple of core um, into a couple of core areas for each special interest group. And the first one of these, I think, is um, one of the ones that was most impactful. Um, and Derek, if you'd like to talk about this one, since this is really your baby. Yeah. So um, as Clayton said, one of our biggest priorities here at Red Hat are to demonstrate that you can run Kubernetes and OpenShift clusters at, at large scale. Um, and one of the items here that made Cube 1.8 uh, that we think will broadly benefit the community uh, was around what happens when things go wrong. So as most users know of uh, about OpenShift and Kubernetes today is that, you know, you, a great debugging tool to find out what's happening in your cluster over the life of your resources are events. And events tend to not be punitive when everything goes well. Um, but in environments where things uh, may not be going well, let's say your, your pod can never start or the image uh, can never be pooled or you're in some crash looping scenario, um, at small scales, it's great to know these things, right? It's great to know that uh, my, my application's not working and I can look at the event. In the long tail, it's, it's really problematic to be, keep being told that your application's not working or that your pod can't pull its image or that a particular event can't happen. So one of the things that we've observed uh, when, when offering our, our OpenShift Online offerings is so oftentimes applications get defined and then they might not ever be able to be converged on their desired state. 
And it's great that the system tells you about it when it first happens. It's bad when it keeps telling you about it constantly over the next week, two weeks, three weeks. And so at scale, what we observed was, let's say you had some percentage of your applications that could never run on the platform because they were poorly configured or something like that. Um, you, you ran into a spam problem to your master, which ultimately could really uh, deteriorate cluster performance. So one of the things that we did to address this was uh, define an event budget. So a given resource uh, has an initial budget of 25 events, and then it has a refill rate of like one event every five minutes. And this had a really dramatic impact on reliability of our clusters. So if you imagine across hundreds of nodes, the chief nodes has you know, one or two pods that may not be successfully running uh, by design, that we, we were able to dramatically reduce the long tail of events being sent to our masters from an environment where we're getting hundreds and hundreds of events per second to approximately three events per second. So at scale, uh, hundreds of nodes where some percentage of those nodes might have pods that don't actually successfully run, we, we, we were able to use our experience to find something and address it so that as cluster operators who are running these application uh, platforms on behalf of other users, users that make mistakes don't wake the cluster operator up at night, right? So uh, I think that this was a, a really good data input to the community. Um, the PR unfortunately didn't land in Cube 17, but did make it in Cube 18. But then along in the Cube 18 cycle, we did things to improve events further. So in addition to the client side rate limiting, uh, we also looked at the actual event sources themselves and started to question if this event was actually valuable to a user or not. Um, and in some cases, we, we made changes where appropriate. And then in addition, uh, we went and added a, an admission controller that allows server-side control to um, uh, control against uh, event spam in practice. So uh, basically, a lot of work was done here to allow cluster operators to feel more secure in giving uh, application users access to the platform so that when those users do something uh, incorrectly, it doesn't get the cluster operator up at night. And so I think this is a great area of, uh, of focus for us and, and demonstrative of our experience in online. Yeah, and I, yeah, I, I would I, add to I that. Add to that. It's very yes, important, important to be able to, um, to take actual customer scenarios uh, and user scenarios and translate those back into meaningful fixes. Um, part of this is closing the loop uh, with, at the very large scales, making a concerted effort to identify, um, you know, the top blockers, um, both from users and for, from customers and from community at large members and people who have had similar problems and try to synthesize the overall an overarching effort out of it. Um, and that's something that uh, we think is um, a unique value to how um, we contribute to Kubernetes. A second part of this very large cluster scaling also came up um, when you are running very, very dense development clusters. That's a scenario that a lot of folks in the Kubernetes community don't necessarily deal with day to day, but it's something that OpenShift users um, very commonly see. Uh, clusters with tens of thousands of applications or tens of thousands of users um, who are quickly spinning up or tearing down applications that may be running as uh, development environments or test environments, um, offering playgrounds to developers to have a, a shared pool of resources where they can at a fairly low cost to the overall organization, experiment in a fashion that's going to really resemble their production environment. Um, obviously, Kubernetes um, tries to be as simple as possible and no simpler. And one of the things that, one of the improvements that uh, went into the alpha state uh, in 1.8 was the ability to take some of these very, very large dense clusters, which are making API calls to get uh, very large numbers of pods or very large numbers of namespaces or user information and to um, add capabilities to both compress and to break those into smaller chunks. Uh, this was really, uh, in a sense, this is driven by actual experience from users uh, as well as in the OpenShift online clusters where uh, we had always planned to do this in Kubernetes, and the 1.8 timeframe was really the right opportunity for us to take these features. Um, compression went in uh, in 1.7, but wasn't enabled, and we began um, really stressing it in the 1.8 timeframe. And the, the 
the chunking of very large API calls into individual results had a benefit both to um, the cluster itself, because a lot of integrations into Kubernetes uh, involve listing everything and then watching for changes. And it's a very powerful pattern because you can continually check to see that you're up at the right state. But when you make those very large requests, it was having an impact on other operations on the cluster. And so by chunking the results, uh, instead of asking for all pods on the cluster, you can ask for the first 500 pods and then get, um, once you've processed those, you can get the next list. We actually plan to enable this by default in Kubernetes uh, 1.9, um, but it should also be available in OpenShift um, in a fairly aggressive pattern. We think that this is gonna be really, really valuable for bringing down um, the tail latencies on both API requests, as well as, honestly, um, the number one impact is that for an end user, large administrative queries um, become much more responsive because you start getting data almost immediately without giving up any of the consistency that you want. And I, I would raise that as well for the previous one. Um, our goal with events was to keep events very useful. Um, we actually made events more useful by focusing on the things that actually were showing up. This sort of refinement, um, you know, is, is Kubernetes maturing into an environment where you can really trust it with all of your applications. And um, as a, you know, as a corollary to both of the first two, uh, observability of Kubernetes as a platform um, is very important to us. Prometheus, um, which is a metrics gathering um, project, open source project that became part of the CNCFs last year, is a really, um, has a really great user experience for application authors and operators to be able to easily pull ad hoc metrics from many different components of a, of a scale out system. Um, the Kubernetes community has worked really closely with Prometheus to uh, to expose metrics to be gathered, but also the, on the Prometheus side to build in um, support for the kind of dynamic, rapidly changing environments that Kubernetes represents. And so we're really excited because we spent a lot of the we spent a lot of the last six months or so working with Prometheus in these very large clusters with Kubernetes and other parts of the Kubernetes ecosystem to take some of the things that we were seeing. Um, and to ensure that we were just driving that level of reliability and um, functionality into Kubernetes. Uh, so Kubernetes comes with kind of a stock set of monitoring. In the 1.8 timeframe, we did a lot of work to um, enhance the edge cases to make sure that uh, operators and administrators looking at these large clusters can get back the data they need about um, how well the, uh, the APIs are responding um, how accurate those APIs are. We've added new metrics in a number of places. Uh, and we're really excited because we think that um, as this becomes more and more formalized, you'll see a larger, you're seeing a large move in the Kubernetes ecosystem to expose these metrics everywhere. Um, that sort of uh, simplification of the ecosystem to where you can very easily get these metrics is gonna really improve the operation and running of uh, large Kubernetes clusters. And Derek, I, I think, you know, this is something that you're deeply familiar as well. The um, the changes that we actually saw as we moved from etcd2 to etcd3. Yeah, I guess the general idea here to me is like there's a difference between what we can monitor in an ivory tower environment and in the upstream, whether it's on PR tests and scale tests versus like what actually happens when you monitor real world production data. Um, so when you know, generally, I, I, I think Prometheus has been an invaluable tool for, for us to kind of get a handle on figuring out, you know, where there's smoke, where there's fire, and where we should focus our energy and, and improving general reliability across the platform. So, you know, as Clayton talked about here with the etcd3 migration, you know, very clearly we were able to see in uh, the move here that we had dramatic improvements in, in network and memory use. You know, just sitting here thinking about this, there are other areas I can think that we that we haven't even called out on the stack where improvements were made. So like, generally speaking, I think um, the the OpenShift use case of Kubernetes is slightly more directed than maybe what you see in the general upstream community. We're slightly more opinionated on how people should follow a particular best practices. And so like things like quota, like Prometheus was invaluable identifying areas where, where quota was making more calls than, than necessary. And then we were able to drive those fixes into, into the upstream. But, Generally speaking, I would say our, our experience with monitoring in the online environments has been really beneficial to understand what happens when real users reuse a platform and helps focus our 
our decision making and inform where we go to make impacts in Q18 around stability. So uh, generally, I think it's just been been great all around. Yeah, and and tying you know to to close out this section on stability because I know everybody's really eager to go see the exciting stuff, which is the features. The whole premise is um, working working in the ecosystem to make sure that not just the core Kubernetes components work well, the, the, the supporting components that people are increasingly beginning to rely on are working well, that they can be monitored, that the kind of due diligence as people start to build not just simple clusters, but more complex clusters, um, that this sort, of, this sort of focus in Kubernetes 1.8 is something that is incredibly practical and everyone will eventually see the benefit of, regardless of where you are today um, on your journey with Kubernetes. So with, without further ado, we will move to the thing that everyone is really excited about, which is new features. And even though we said that this was a stabilization release, um, it's very difficult to convince 380 people not to go do specific targeted features that make people's lives better. So I've, tried to bring, um, Derek and I will kind of go through the different areas of Kubernetes and we'll highlight some of the top level features. As I said before, the detail on these is, um, it's pretty, a lot of these are pretty deep and there's a ton of things that don't even show up on this list. Um, we'll leave time at the end for questions about um, areas that you may not have seen or if you um, are unclear about these as we go through. So uh, without further ado, let's start on the exciting stuff, Derek. Yeah. So. Uh... I think a lot of stuff interesting happened in Kubernetes one day in the SIG auto scaling space. Um, some of these represent areas that we've, at as a community and especially from Red Hat, tried to represent um, what our users were asking for and, and trying to drive core features into the platform. So uh, one of the, the first items here is folks might have seen there's a new incubator project around a metrics server and a metrics API. Uh, this is really setting the groundwork for us to get uh, a future replacement for Heapster and 1.9 in the community. And so I think uh, it's, it's just setting a good foundation for us to grow on moving forward. Uh, second item here that's of real interest to me, and this has been uh, something that we've been trying to push through the community for up to two years now, I think about, uh, and has slowly evolved from alpha to beta now in this release is Oftentimes we get the request that users want to scale their applications horizontally on a custom metric source. So today in the platform, you, you initially had just CPU as a, as a scaling target, then memory got added. And uh, now in uh, the Cube 1.8 release, you have the ability for your horizontal pod auto scaler to um, target custom metrics as a scaling signal. So uh, as an input to that, there's a custom metrics API that uh, third parties can implement uh, to support integrating with the horizontal pod autoscaler natively and generally then would be able to give additional signals to choose when and how you might want to scale your applications um, where the particular resources that Cube supported natively might not fit. So this is really exciting for us to see that uh, this is now graduated into beta. Um, in addition, we've had a lot of feedback about just a lot of people are curious, like, what's going on with my horizontal pod autoscaler? Why is something scaling or not scaling? Um, so we did a, a lot of work to try to improve the visibility into the status of a particular HPA so that when things are going right, you know why, and when things are going wrong, you can better pinpoint why exactly they're going wrong. So um, in general, I think a lot of exciting things happen in this space. and. Uh, a lot of the stuff laid the groundwork for doing more and better advanced things in the future, in particular around like usage-based scheduling concepts. So uh, I, th I think a lot of a lot of fun stuff here in this release. Oops. Oops. Sorry, guys. It wouldn't be a uh, wouldn't be a presentation without some technical difficulties. You all see my screen still? Yep. Sorry. So uh, with the um, the one eight release, we're also continuing a lot of the extension work that we've been uh, focused on from um, the very beginning of Kubernetes, making it easier for people to be able to plug in their own pieces to Kubernetes. And this is something we see as fundamental to the success of Kubernetes as an ecosystem is 
you know, not just someone who takes the code and forks it and adds in some some tweaks can change how a Kubernetes cluster is monitored or is uh, is controlled or is uh, limited, but those can be easily done by people who plug in on top. And so in the 1.8 release, there were several areas of uh, extensibility that we continue to mature. And one of the more interesting ones and is flex volumes, which were a concept that were, was added uh, quite early in the Kubernetes release to kind of release the pressure on, I want to integrate my new storage provider and um, have that be injected into the pods running on the cluster. Um, if you, uh, the kind of the normal process is you build some code into Kubernetes and you change the Kubernetes APIs and you wait a couple of years and, um, once you get to that point, you're in the Kubernetes API, but obviously that won't scale to the kinds of um, new and interesting technologies that people add in the future. Uh, flex volumes were the first approach to allow people to uh, dynamically add new volume types to Kubernetes pods um, on, on the fly after our cluster had been installed. Uh, there's work ongoing in the community to uh, standardize this as the container storage interface. That work will probably last you know, throughout the next few releases, and in the meantime, what we really wanted to do was ensure that flex volumes were easy to uh, use on a cluster. And so there's been work in Kubernetes 1.8 to make the to make it very easy to inject a new flex volume provider into all nodes on a cluster um, through a daemon set. And so the the flex volume provider is containerized, and that can be um, that can be easily deployed on top of Kubernetes, which then allows applications to um, administrators to both experiment with new flex volumes as well as to try them out. There's a lot of really exciting stuff being discussed um, that would allow us to do more sophisticated secrets and security integration by leveraging flex volumes. So you can imagine a flex volume that injects into pods a, um, a secret that is provided by the platform but is never stored on the platform, um, such as a Kerberos principle or um, another form of uh, like a, a private key uh, injected by a, a vendor integration uh, for doing security across the cluster. We want to, we've also worked to make flex volumes something that can be controlled by a security policy in Kubernetes. And so that's just one concrete example of, um, it is an area where there are many different ways that you may want to provide content into a pod and working to make sure those AP APIs are stable and are easy to use. Um, custom resource definitions, which are the replacement for third-party resources, uh, got a couple of feature improvements this release, including the ability to do validations. That work will continue. We want custom resources to be the easiest way to add um, new, um, new APIs to the cluster. And there's just a ton of work that's uh, continuing both at the node and the API server level to uh, mature how you can hook into the platform as an administrator at the very lowest level. Um, let me start. All right, Derek. Yep. So along that line, um, some of the new features that were coming out of a uh, six storage um, that we wanted to call it here that were of interest to folks was generally uh, the initial request for a persistent volume claim might not be the right long-term request. So um, work was being done uh, in the Q1A release to allow you to dynamically resize your PVC. Um, so you could grow a 10 gig to 100 gig uh, PVC without, um, well, as, as you basically would want. Uh, the, the increase is, is intended to be transparent and work is being flushed out to make sure it worked well with quota and all the other things. Uh, but uh, basically a lot of good progress was made in the Cube 1.8 release around this feature. Uh, in addition, it's a common request that people want to be able to snapshot their volumes and then potentially create a new PVC from that snapshot. Uh, work was being done in an in a alpha phase to support this in Cube 1.8, and it's probably representative of what you'll see in future releases as, as getting progressed to beta and stable. But um, a lot of the, the basic primitives that people would look for around PVCs were getting a nice attention in the Cube 1.8 cycle. Uh, networking is also uh, an area that's just continued to to evolve. We're not trying to be too aggressive, but to um, do this. Uh, IPVS is a 
uh, IP virtual servers in Linux is a kernel feature that's been there for quite a long time. Uh, you can think of it as a little bit of an upgrade over the IP tables based version of Cube Proxy. And there's an alpha implementation in Cube 1.8 that will go through some hardening and testing uh, contributed by the, the folks at Huawei. Uh, you know, we're hopeful that in the next few releases, this will be something that allows us to um, improve uh, service level connections between pods. Network policy also continues to evolve. Um, some of the concepts from OpenShift like egress policy, um, making their way into Kubernetes network policy, uh, as well as CIDR rules for pod matching. A lot of small incremental improvements and stabilization that make it easier to um, ensure that users and operators can find the right balance between running containerized applications um, and um, preserving security. Yeah, so uh, another major area that uh, has been close to my heart uh, is around how we're going to um, broaden the set of workloads that um, can run on the Kubernetes platform. So folks have might have seen a recent blog post announcement about uh, the resource management work group. And this was an effort that we at Red Hat had kicked off, oh, I want to say in the beginning of this year to try to really formalize how we can uh, take resource management and Kubernetes to the next level. And so from that, uh, we've had a lot of great community participation from Google, Intel, NVIDIA, and others around how we can uh, support you know, more workloads uh, with better performance without actually sacrificing node reliability. Because as folks probably have seen, we did a lot of work in the community through Kube 1.6 to kind of stabilize uh, the node and, and uh, provide you know, improve reliability around things like Quas and, and the secret park and stuff. Uh, and so we felt like uh, after that point, it was the right time to pivot and ask how we can make things better, or support more workloads better. So in the, in the resource management working group, we had spent a lot of time on identifying like what, what key focus areas could we tackle to um, uh, drive iterative improvement, uh, improvements into the platform. Uh, and so for the Cube 18 release, we focused on three areas. One was around how we better improve uh, CPU management on the node. Um, second one was around how do we support device plugins. And in my head, this is for folks who've been tracking the community. You know, we had alpha support for GPUs, uh, but in order to really graduate it into a beta or stable foundation, we needed to get into a model where um, you weren't having to integrate uh, support for particular hardware devices natively into the core platform. So device plugins was a model to, to try to address that. And then finally, uh, certain workloads, uh, you know, have particular memory uh, requirements that we were hearing over and over. It would be nice if you could consume things like huge pages to, to broaden the set of workloads that could run well on the platform. And so work had been done in that area as well. So if we dive down a little bit deeper on, say, CPU pinning, uh, this is an exciting feature for me. Uh, so folks who might have been uh, familiar with the quality of service model today we have in Kubernetes, we have this concept of best effort, uh, burstable, and guaranteed service tiers. And so in the best effort tier, basically a pod can use, you know, as much resource as it can scavenge. You know, in the burstable tier, a pod can have a minimum request for a particular amount of resource, uh, but then can burst above that request uh, as, as resources become available. Uh, but one of the things we had observed uh, as a community was that there wasn't a huge performance benefit uh, in going up to the last tier around guaranteed quads. So um, one of the major things that we've worked on uh, at Red Hat and with our friends at Intel was trying to make it that you did not actually have a performance penalty by running in the guaranteed quads tier by allowing you to actually get improved latency benefits. So the way we chose to tackle this was uh, a new feature you'll see in the in the node, uh, Kubelet Agent, where you can configure a node to have a particular CPU management policy. So uh, the one policy that we've been exploring heavily uh, in Cube 1.8 and is alpha is what we're calling the static uh, CPU pinning policy. And what that allows you to do is say, if a pod requests one core of CPU or two cores of CPU, uh, that that pod will get access to an exclusive core over its life, and it'll never move. Uh, and that has a lot of latency benefits. 
uh, in that it's not uh, fighting any noisy neighbors on the same core. Um, and uh, I think generally speaking, this would be a broadly applicable performance improvement for a lot of workload types. Uh, it's a bit intelligent on how it chooses to uh, assign particular cores, so it actually will inspect your physical processor topology to try to find the best fit for your workload on that node. Um, we don't expect that this will be the be-all, end-all only CPU management policy that nodes might be configured to support, so other, other options have been explored uh, for future analysis around, like, uh, rather than a, a static policy, a dynamic policy, where uh, pods might get an exclusive core for a momentary period in time. Um, but uh, basically, in 1.8, a lot of great work was being done to improve CPU latency. Uh, if we want to move on to the next item. So device plugins, as I said, uh, GPU support has long been alpha in the project. And as a community, we were trying to think about how we can best move it to uh, a beta or stable fashion. And a key tenant of that is Generally speaking, there was nothing special about GPUs versus any other hardware device. And so uh, at Red Hat, obviously, it's really important to us that like, if you can get access to a device on your Linux host, we want to be able to let you get access to that device uh, in your pod. And so the first step that's being done to support that was uh, what we're calling the device plugin model. And this has been a, another great community effort across Google, NVIDIA, and, and Red Hat. And the idea here is basically we want to have a vendor neutral way of allowing uh, plugins to be deployed on the cluster so that we can just support discovery of that vendor specific device and then make that device visible up to the scheduler so that pods can actually make requests for it and get them scheduled. And then at the end of the day, ensure that when you're running in production where devices may fail or, 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 or be temporarily unhealthy, that we have all the right metaphors in place to ensure that if your device does fail, what will happen uh, to remedy the situation. So in the 1.8 release, uh, we have a, an alpha plugin model, and we've been trying to validate this model against particular classes of devices, so in particular GPUs and certain custom NICs. And uh, this will be an area that we continue to explore moving forward to ultimately try to get things like GPUs to beta or stable. So great stuff there. And then the last item here, when I talk about huge pages briefly, this is this is one of those things that when you want it, you really want it, and uh, uh, sometimes this can be viewed as an, an impediment to bringing certain workloads onto the cluster. So, if you are an operator of an application that's uh, managing a very large memory set, so whether it's a particular database management system or a large uh, Java middleware application. Um, Oftentimes, people have tuned those applications to take advantage of huge pages, and not having huge pages support on the platform was an impediment to bringing on those workloads. So in the Cube 18 release, uh, you now have the ability to let your pod make a huge page request, and then your um, application uh, is properly isolated and accounted to be able to use those huge pages, and you can consume them through all the metaphors you'd expect, so both via shared memory and um, as an empty dir volume. So I suspect that uh, in Cuba 9 and beyond, this will evolve into a stable state. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, in general, this sort of targeting application workloads um, and being practical about, there's a there's kind of a gap between the Kubernetes idealized that many people use it as, as a microservices platform where you don't care about some aspects or performance, you might be more focused on the gross levels or the, the development efficiencies you can gain. Um, it's also equally important to us to ensure that that broad range of applications both can run on Kubernetes, but also get advantages from running from Kubernetes. And as we talked about, as we mentioned um, during the metrics section, um, really one of the long-term goals is to be able to tie actual concrete resource. You know, people use Kubernetes, they love it because it's easy to deploy applications on. Um, people love OpenShift because it's easy to iterate on applications on top of Kubernetes. Uh, to us, closing that loop so that you can run all these different types of applications and get your benefits and get good performance, and then closing the loop back so that the cluster operator and people running clusters for other people can actually get uh, good utilization 
to, to see these applications stack up and be used efficiently across an entire cluster um, and to, to be able to see those higher utilization numbers in very large dense clusters, but also in production clusters um, so that you, you think less about how to run your applications and they just work. And, and that really does tie back to um, you know, one, of the, one of the features that we care very much about at the lowest levels of the platform is ensuring that the interface between the kernel and the application user space inside the container and the cluster is as efficient and as easy to support as possible. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, containers are just Linux. And you know, the work that we do in the kernel and device drivers and overlay and user namespaces and SE Linux and security is really all about ensuring that um, an application workload that runs on um, one Linux cluster runs on it consistently. Um, you know, when we talk about the reasons why we focus so strongly on this, um, the kernel and the the low level levels or the levels of Linux tying up through Kubernetes into OpenShift um, is so that we can ensure that applications work correctly across the board. And so Cryo um, is a big investment area for us. Um, you know, as a container runtime running under Kubernetes, designed to work with Kubernetes, um, works on top of OCI standard containers, is able to run um, all Docker images that exist today. The focus for us really is um, cutting out parts of the cutting out parts of the container runtime that um, hurt our ability to ensure applications are portable and um, ensure they are reliable. And so we've. Uh, we've been working pretty hard uh, as a team um, in the community with others in the ecosystem like Intel and SUSE to get Cryo to its um, first release candidate. Um, it is certified against Cube 1.8 um, and has been has passed all the tests there for quite a while, or Cube 1.7, I'm sorry, and all the tests there. Um, we're working on getting that support post-release for 1.8 um, and then being able to move um, Cryo to production status. Um, not everyone may choose to use Cryo. Um, our hope is that we can really demonstrate the value of a simpler and Kubernetes focused container runtime and how it ties into um, Kubernetes as a platform um, that's excellent for running applications um, on top of Linux, which Red Hat arguably knows as well as anyone. Um, and so uh, we'll, you'll see a lot more about Cryo uh, in the coming weeks and days. Um, our goal is to make sure that there's a diverse ecosystem of, um, of container runtimes and that can trade off different advantages for end users, but also focus on the thing that just works well for Kubernetes. And so those are the high level features in Kubernetes 1.8. Um, there's a ton of, there's a ton more detail that um, we could get into. Um, I urge everyone uh, when the Kubernetes 1.8 release is announced to go look at the release notes. Um, there'll be an infinite amount of blogs and blog posts from everybody in the community talking about the things that they personally care about the most. Um, to me, that's a sign of the success of Kubernetes. Um, you know, it's hard to point to someone today who hasn't realized the same thing that Red Hat realized almost three years ago that Kubernetes was going to be the future. And so we're really excited to have everybody um, join us on that. Kubernetes 1.9 um, is, you know, it's still fairly early in the uh, SIG groups. There's a lot of things that individual SIGs are still working through. Um, you'll start to see over the next few weeks that um, coalesce into SIG specific goals. Um, at the top level uh, across the project, these are some things that we've talked about in, um, in SIG architecture and at community meetings already, stability and bug fixes continue to be key. Um, continuing extensibility, you know, we really want, we, we have to keep chugging through extensibility. Uh, our goal on the OpenShift side is that um, extensibility in Cube ain't done until OpenShift runs. And to, that, to us, that means, you know, setting that path where something as powerful and complex as OpenShift can run as an extension on top of Kubernetes. Um, we think it's possible. It's going to take some time to get there, but it's a, it's a key goal for us to both, um, all the right mechanisms are in place, so all of the use cases that we see um, on the OpenShift side from administrators and users, the, the specific controls they want are also available um, as a proof point um, without having to get OpenShift uh, to use those. And finally, uh, scaling improvements um, across the board. 
just continuing to refine our approach to how we add more and more components in the ecosystem. And that's scaling, not just from a performance perspective, but from a community and ecosystem and integration and security perspective. It should be easy to extend the platform and preserve, uh, preserve security. And so each of these kind of builds off each other. Um, Derek, do you wanna talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the more specific ones? Yeah, I'll, I'll call out a couple. So um, I think, generally speaking, there's always a lot of interest on how we can um, provide more sensibility around patterns like initializers and custom webhook uh, plugins uh, for where emission controllers being in tree or a challenge. I think generally that's an area we're continuing to invest and in, in, in validate against. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to proceed on that in one nine. Uh, the descheduler is an interesting uh, topic area for me. So um, as folks might have seen, there's now a new incubator project uh, around the descheduler, which is basically asking uh, asking the question of, has things have been scheduled now? Uh, is there a now, is there a better place for that pod to be scheduled, you know, today versus last week? And um, I mean, this is like the next step on some of the stuff that's been going on in the scheduling community around asking like, do I have capacity to run this workload? Now it's asking, are my previous decisions my optimal decisions? And so the descheduler is an interesting focus area on there. Uh, priority and prevention is another interest area within SIG scheduling. Um, and I think it's really critical for us being able to run more cluster services as daemon sets. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to get that over the hump in, in one nine. Uh, generally speaking, on the node level improvements, you know, I touched on a lot of those things that got added as alpha features around CPU pinning and and G, uh, device plugin support and, and that type of thing. I think generally in the 1.9 release, you'll see a lot of stabilization of those uh, features in preparation to look to get to beta in 1.10 and beyond. Uh, as Clayton touched on, Cryo, you know, we, we are passing all of the 1.7 node ED and cluster tests and uh, we encourage folks to to check that out. Um, very shortly after the Cube 1.8 release, you'll see a, a branch of Cryo that will meet the same need on Cube 1.8. Um, and what's nice about that is uh, the, all the all the features that you would expect will just work. So all the all the metrics gathering that you get from C Advisor today you now work with Cryo and stuff. Um, but generally speaking, yeah, one nine is a very short release window. So I think the best thing we can to do is is focused on stability in that time frame and uh and, and grow the things that we've started uh, to completion responsibly over the next one to two releases and um you know i i think you know in in closing you know across the board um this is a kubernetes is a long haul project uh, for us, we want uh, kubernetes to be the best place to run containerized applications we want it to be transformational to how um, how large organizations build and develop software. We want it to be a, a stable ecosystem that allows um, people to, to uh, orient themselves, to provide value, to build solutions that work for other people and to make that easy to run and secure and manage. Uh, we think that just like the operating system in Linux was transformational in making it possible to do, to see the, the world we have today, that we want Kubernetes to help uh, build the world um, that we'll see tomorrow. So expect expect us to keep um, walking this path of making it a predictable and excellent place to run applications. And uh, we'll take questions uh, if anyone uh, would like to ask. There there are a couple, um, Clayton and, and Derek, and thank you for this. And and I think your point about uh, the best feature is, is the community. So um, these, a lot of great work has been done by lots of different organizations and individuals on this this release, so it's pretty a notable release. One of the questions um, was, has there been any notable progress on the service catalog in 1.8? You know that I I, uh, I knew that there was something really important that I was forgetting, um, and so there's a slide that's missing. Uh, thank you for for the service catalog. Uh, went through a ton of work in 1.8. Um, a number of people from um, quite a few companies worked extremely hard to bring it to um, beta status. The, there's kind of a, a few loose ends. The goal is to make it uh, beta uh, almost very, very shortly after Cube. And 
the service catalog in a lot of respects is the first extensible part of Kubernetes. It's something that runs on top of Kubernetes and plugs in, but is not actually tied to the Kubernetes release. So our goal, um, you know, it has been a test bed and has helped pave the way and the folks involved have certainly jumped through some hoops, but it's going to make everything else in the Kubernetes ecosystem better. So the goal is to get to beta um, and to have that be available for people to consume and use um, very, very shortly. Mm -hmm. And the one other thing that um, maybe I missed it, and maybe Andy missed it too, was there anything on federation support? Is it and is it still worked on? Derek. Yeah, I'll touch on that. So I think in the community there was a lot of um, uh, there, there, so over the Cube One Eight release there was a, a federation face to face where a lot of the core. Uh, contributing companies got together and and tried to sit back and ask was Federation going in the right direction and what we can do to accelerate it. Uh, so folks might have seen some announcements that went out where uh, SIG Federation will be renamed to SIG Multi-Cluster. And one of the challenges that we're looking to address and looking at things like service catalog actually as a proof point was um, uh, how can we decompose Federation into a, a smaller set of items uh, geared to particular uh, use cases rather than necessarily one large monolith called Federation. So out of that, uh, there's an effort going on uh, right now, actually, and hopefully we'll see more uh, in Cube 1.9 to move Federation out of the Cube tree proper. And uh, in that move of out of the uh, Cube Cube tree, uh, it's being decomposed into two pieces. So there'll be a cluster registry component, which for folks who are tracking Federation, Cluster was the unique API resource offered by that um, project. And so generally speaking, everybody thought the Cluster Registry is a useful concept or foundational tool to build a lot of other tools. So uh, out of that SIG, there's an effort to go and, and decompose the Cluster Registry into a standalone deployable artifact um, and using the Federation uh, code base as a base to kick that effort off. And then generally speaking, uh, one of the other things uh, that we at Red Hat have been pushing hard on in Federation is to ensure that uh, it has a stable life cycle release cadence. So uh, I think there had been some confusion across the community about when Federation says a particular API resource had reached you know, beta status. Um, I think that uh, that wasn't always clear what was meant by that. And so what we're trying to do is by moving the Federation code base out of tree, um, getting into a cadence where a particular release of queue would go out the door and then Federation would verify it functions against that stable release. So in the same way that like service catalog will say, I, I, I work well on a cube one eight platform, uh, Federation will probably start to trail mainline cube releases and say that uh, plus two weeks, plus three weeks, figure out the number after a cube release, they would be a, a federation release. And then that gives the hardening you need to know that as things get into a, a cube release at the end of the day, very last minute, that federation had the chance to respond and, and validate against it. So uh, I think generally speaking, federation is still incubating uh, and growing and it's starting to decompose so that we can accelerate getting its use cases out to the community. Yeah. All right, and there's a couple more questions, um, if you guys have got time. Um, and this might be a little detail, but on the auto-scaling feature, someone's asking if we can scale an app based on combined condition of multiple metrics. And his example is he'd like to scale his app when the CPU is at 80, you know, above 80% and the memory is above 75%. You know, have you done a deep look at that yet? Uh, yeah, so right now that uh, the, I guess the combinatory scaling target is not something that uh, we support natively. Um, but it's interesting to sit back and reflect on. So uh, I think we'll go back to SIG auto scaling and kind of touch on that use case a little bit more to see where it may or may not break down. Yeah. And then as always, it's gotta be a Prometheus question. Um, with Prometheus becoming available in the future, how will how easy will it be for customers using Prometheus now in OCP 3.5, 3.6 to migrate? 
Um, so what our focus is with Prometheus is um, there's kind of three three areas we want to hit in kind of a, a sp kind of a specific order. So um, I t we talked about instrumenting and doing a better job in Kubernetes and an OpenShift of providing the instrumentation, making sure it's correct. Um, we want to make available a, uh, a Prometheus image that is supported by Red Hat um, for the use of gathering uh, cluster metrics, operational metrics um, that will tie into uh, Cloudforms. Um, and actually, Cloudforms will have the ability to read Prometheus. So we think there'll be some really um, valuable integrations there for customers who are managing, customers and users managing very large numbers of clusters. So much more of an open shift use case. Um, on the those metrics uh, and the alerts within it, you know, integrating with Prometheus really well. Our goal would be, we will offer an out of the box set of um, collectors that gather all the metrics of the platform. Um, and we do want it to be possible to take and collect additional metrics. Now, obviously with metrics, um, you know, every, I think this is a little bit like um, backups or, um, or security, everybody has a slightly different approach, but everybody's trying to accomplish the same goals. Um, we're gonna try not to be too prescriptive on exactly how the metrics operationally are calculated. We wanna take advantage of the flexibility of Prometheus um, to slice and dice metrics in a couple different ways. Um, our goal will be to take most of the elements of the Prometheus ecosystem that work well and begin to support them and um, out of the box, gather those for the cluster and for the components running on the cluster. The next step would be making it easy to use Prometheus within a namespace or in a set of namespaces. So just like we have a Jenkins image in OpenShift that um, you can use that integrates well with the platform, we'd like to have a fairly simple integration there for um, what you might call tenant Prometheus. And then the third step, the third step down the road would be um, a Prometheus that can do multi-tenant metrics at scale. Um, and actually that's, as part of that custom metric stuff that we talked about, we actually anticipate that being um, one of the first paths where that Prometheus would be used. But multi-tenant Prometheus is a somewhat complicated project. We don't want to jump too early into it. Um, so we're going we're gonna to take baby steps through the custom metrics work um, to gather metrics from all the applications on the platform at a very high level for the purposes of auto scaling. Um, and then slowly um, make it easier for operational teams to run um, their own Prometheus together. I would say most people using Prometheus today, um, you'll see our new config file, you'll see our images. We have a set of tools around securing that Prometheus. Um, it should be a fairly easy switch and we'll definitely wanna work with people who have um, complex um, rules and configs that we may not have thought about um, and make sure that's easy for people to integrate into the cluster monitoring. Cool. I think that's all we have time for in terms of questions. Um, as always, great job, Clayton and Derek, on, on this one. And um, if you have more questions or if you want to take a watch this video again, we'll just post it on our YouTube channel um, and post it on blog.openshift.com. Um, so it'll be up probably by the end of day today. And as we said, we'll put links to um, the Kubernetes 1.8 release notes so that you can reach that. And if you are coming to KubeCon, um, you can hear um, probably both Derek and Clayton talking again um, on the release that's hopefully 1.9-ish by then um, on December 5th at the OpenShift Commons Gathering. And I'll send you links and register for that too. So again, Derek, for all your work and um, everybody in the community for all the work that's gone into Kubernetes and uh, we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you.